Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. We've been, in the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about uh, the light of the Spirit. And, and last week we really emphasized living from the inside out rather than the outside in. Romans 8 says that if we set our minds on the flesh or the outside things, what does it lead to? Death. Anybody wake up this morning and go, ah, I think death over life is a good decision. No. And then he says, if we set our minds on the spirit, we have what? Life. Anybody in the room would like to have more life? It would be good, wouldn't it? Uh, it, it? It's just a positive thing. And so here, the same author writes to the church in Galatia. And in Galatians 5.25, he says that he starts off the verse with this word, if. What a powerful two-letter word, isn't it? If, it leaves an option, doesn't it? Um, if you can't find a seat, you get to sit on the front row. That stuff thinks yes, it's awesome. I love a cool room. Um, if we live by the Spirit, that's a big if. I mean, please don't raise your hands here, but how many of you could say that you live the majority of the week under the influence and total control of the Holy Spirit? If we live by the Spirit, let us also, what? Walk by the Spirit. Now, if you were Nicodemus, you would go, now, how am I supposed to do that? I mean, I drive a car. How am I supposed to walk? You know, I mean, you would just get a little practical, a little nick on us. But that's not what it means. And what we want to discover and kind of unfold is what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? Now, last week we threw up a... A diagram to you, and it's in, it's, it appears again a little bit uh, better in your celebration guide. And we know that you're made up of a, a mind, a will, or a body, soul, and spirit. And your soul is made up of three parts: a mind, a will, and emotion. Uh, I just kind of in review. Just want to let you know that this, when, when the scripture says that we're created in His image, and we are, we see this in the soul, the mind. Represents the Father, the will, the Son, and the emotion, the Holy Spirit. And we talked last week about fellowship and uh, of those three together, the importance of them. We know that in John chapter 17, that Jesus, before he goes to the cross, he says, Lord, may they be one just as you and I are one. And we think that that means that we should get along together. But when you study the doctrine of the Trinity... The Trinity has some interesting things to it. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in complete harmony and fellowship, and they love the relationship that they have with each other. When Jesus is going to the cross, what he's wanting to do is he's wanting that harmony to be reapplied to us in a way that our mind, our will, and our emotions are functioning correctly. And then we have also talked about that Jesus gets really excited because he tells his disciples if I've got to leave you so that the Holy Spirit can come, and so we'll put up the Holy Spirit here. Also in there is your spirit. We'll see that in the verse probably next week that those two, your spirit and the Holy Spirit, do exist. It's mentioned, uh, they both are mentioned in Scripture, so they are there. And what we discovered and talked about last week is, is that oftentimes there are circumstances that divide these three, the mind, the will, and the emotion, in us. Now, there are two primary ways that those are divided. And this is, uh, I want you to slow down for a moment and just and get this. Number one, the first way that you get divided, we talked about it. If you didn't get this message last week, I, I can't go back and, and tell you the importance of, of not getting stuck in one of these three, the mind, the will, or the emotion. That was last week. But we do know that when things, number one, either happen to you, or sin enters your life, it begins to di divide the mind and the will and the emotion. And so the next, what happens is we see that the division gets a little stronger, and then a little stronger, and then a little stronger. And the next thing we know, we're operating completely opposite of the way that Christ intended us to. And when this happens, we feel lonely. We begin to feel depressed. Understand that out of the soul flows every feeling that you have. And so if this soul isn't functioning the way that God intended it to function, what's that going to do to your feelings? And how is that going to affect your outside circumstances? 
Living from the inside out means, okay, I need the helper to heal this so that my soul and my spirit affect my outward actions, not the other way around. Most people are living from the outside in. Most people, you ask them, what's a prevalent question we ask people? How's your day going? Right? You know, how many of you have asked somebody that this week? How's your day going? How many of you have had to answer it? How many of you have lied? <laughs> Here we come up. Good morning, good morning. How you doing? Fine. What does that mean? Fine. Liar, liar, pants on fire. I love it. I asked somebody this morning, I could tell by the look in their eye, it's not going well. It's okay. That's awesome. But what happens is when this is not healthy and it's not being empowered by the Holy Spirit, it affects this because of the way we feel and the way we see things. And so it's extremely huge. Now, God created us to be in an intimate relationship with us. And I want to talk for just a moment about something very practical. It's not completely the spirit-filled life. It's going to sound more like relationship stuff. But Jesus made it clear in the gospel that if you love him, you're going to end up loving your neighbor as your... The two loves go hand in hand. There are three basic laws of attraction. Physical, soulish, or what we call relational, and spiritual. Those are the three laws of attraction. Now watch this. If you're involved in an intimate relationship with somebody and the, and the attraction is on all three levels, then there's deep intimacy. If you're married to somebody and you're relating to them spiritually, relationally, with your mind, will, and emotion, I mean, you're your soulmates, you've got uh, soul ties and everything is working in harmony, then, and you're attracted to each other, if that's the case, if your marriage is a cinch, and it's bliss. You wake up every morning going, thank God I'm married. I can't believe it. I can't believe you gave such a gift. If you're only connecting on two of the three, then you hear words like this, the sentences like this. Marriage is hard work, but it's worth it. And anytime somebody tells you that, anytime somebody goes, marriage is hard work, but it's worth it, you know what they're telling you? They're saying, I'm, I am clicking on two out of the three laws of attraction. If we're only connected with one out of the three laws, then we'll, we won't say this unless we're in some counseling session or something. Or we'll say to ourselves, marriage is hard work and I'm pretty sure it's not worth it. And then if we're not connected on any three, you're just playing house and you're miserable. In our relationship with God, the same is true. Now, what happens and how these we really do when we live from the outside in, which is really bad advice, it starts like this. I don't know how you started your intimate relationship with your significant other, but it, you know, in my case, I walked into the English room and uh, in high school, it was my junior year, and I'm surveying in the room. I go, oh, how you doing? This? Unfortunately, she wasn't on the same wavelength as me. It took years later for her to go, how are you doing back? <laughs> Not better. <laughs> but oftentimes we meet and go, oh, how are you doing? Not looking so bad. And then we, we go out on a date or we talk or we Facebook or we do something. I don't know what you guys do nowadays to connect, but you start engaging your mind, your will, and feelings begin to develop. And then all of a sudden, expectations come along. And unfortunately, in our culture, we do something crazy like this. I know now that we've been out on a half a dozen dates and I really like you, you want to go to church with me? Which one should have happened first? And by the way, it's not about going to church. And I'm always amazed at what I think I say versus what you hear. Last week, I did not say that church is only for saints. I said, stop coming to church and start coming to a king. Dozens of people, hundreds of people go to church on every Sunday morning, but they don't acknowledge the king. And what a change it makes when we come to worship 
a king rather than coming to get a check mark off on something that we've done so that God will be happy with us and hopefully we'll get to go to heaven and maybe he'll bless us this week because not only did we go to church, but we actually sang a song and we took notes. Extra credit stayed away the whole time. <laughs> and just to pile on, I threw some money in that bag more in there than the person next to me. Yeah, I know I'm doing good. No, that's not what it's all about. It's about coming to a king and going, you are my king. You are my king. But oftentimes, we enter relationships and it always stays on this outward part right here. And Paul said, and we looked at it last week, that if the mind that, the mind that is set on the outside, on the flesh, it leads to separation. I know, there's, there's people in the room going, well, you don't know how good looking I am, and I'm going to pull this off. Shut up. I've got bad news for you. Every day we're getting older, and the late 40s and 50s are coming. So what you going to do then? <laughs> you had better find somebody who you are connected with here, and it affects the, the relationship and the soul. And then that affects the perspective of that individual. It changes everything. You try to live from the outside in, and you're going to end up like the majority of marriages in our culture today, divorced. How many of you, you can raise your hand? How many of you would like to be connected on all three? Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, like you're just like, woo So often, marriages get in trouble because the guys don't tell the girls how beautiful they are. And they need to know that because there's division in the soul and they're not feeling the connection of the soul because it's not, you're not walking by the spirit. Now, I will say this, if you're walking by the spirit, man, your spirit is mixed with his, and your soul is being healed, and you help him heal your wife's soul, you will tell her occasionally, you know, look at you today. It's a good thing, by the way. Just a little hint out there. <laughs> Don't know when her birthday is for you or your anniversary, but just a little hint. Well, what I want to what I want to just reiterate here is that these two things that happen to us, either things that are done to us or sin that enters our life. It interrupts the fellowship of our souls. And the Holy Spirit is introduced in here so that he can start taking these barriers away so that we can have inner peace. So that we can have communion. So that we can have unity with the Holy Spirit in such a way that now the way that we see things and, and hear things are actually in truth. The things that we feel no longer dictate us. But... The mind of Christ does. Jesus said, let this mind, or Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, there are three spiritual exercises that I want to go ahead and throw out there to you. These are great small group discussions. Three spiritual exercises that help this. But out, without the Holy Spirit, these three exercises just become something of a ritual that mean absolutely nothing. First of all, God's word says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. If you and I would practice and create a lifestyle and, and set a time aside every day where we go, okay, God, I just want to take a moment to praise you. I just want to take a, a contemplative moment to say, wow, you are so big and I am so small. You are so much bigger than my circumstances. I just don't let me forget that today. You're bigger than my hurts. Those people that hurt me, you're bigger than that. Your love is bigger than that. And then turn to truth. Listen, you and I need to stick our bony little noses in the word. We need to read, listen, a minimum of a chapter a day and just ask God, give me one verse that I can meditate on throughout the day. And maybe in that verse, if you want to do something really fun, pick out one word. And just pick one word and go, you know what, throughout the day, I want to think about that particular word. Now, how hard is that? Why do we need to do that? I'll tell you why we need to do that. Because these things right here, when they're not under the control of the Holy Spirit, 
they convince us of, our feelings convince us of things that aren't true. We've been saying this for a month or so now. It's very, this, is very, this is very fundamental. Just because you feel it doesn't mean it's true. Just because you feel it doesn't mean it's true. Does it? We need the truth, the spirit of truth, to dictate our desires, not our feelings. And see, if we're not living in harmony because of heartaches and things that have been done to us that lead us into medicating our souls with sin, if we don't stop that process, we become self-destructive. And then we, we don't even have any fellowship with God. And now, all of a sudden, I promise you, if you engage in that process, I promise you that now you are now a slave to all of your circumstances. Terrible place to be. You're now enslaved by the opinions of others. You're now enslaved by the economics or your checking account. You're now enslaved by the way your children misbehave or behave. You're now enslaved by what your maid thinks of you. You're now enslaved by how work goes with you. You're now enslaved by other people's opinions of you, and it's a destructive trap. It's so important to live from the inside out. Listen, the spirit of truth right here, when you read God's word, especially Psalm 139, you find out what he thinks about you, and that affects this right here. Oh, you knew me and netted me in my mother's womb. Your thoughts of me out the outnumber the sands of the sea? Really? Wow. You see, after I've told God what I love about him, he so desperately and passionately wants to tell me. But it's so important. Now watch. When you and I involve ourselves in daily praise and worship, personal Bible study, pray, uh, uh, prayer and obedience, then the Holy Spirit gets stirred up within us and starts taking these lines away. We start having fellowship, and the Holy Spirit starts empowering us to live in a way that our outside circumstances don't dictate our happiness or our moods. It does, our, our God, who's inside, greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. You know, you know, you know what must be bizarre to all of eternity? Is when they look down and see people who claim to be children of God with the Monday morning monographs on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It must be bizarre to them. It must be completely bizarre to them. And so we understand that living from the inside out, having and walking with the Spirit, produces life. Now, here's just a quick question. Just rewind the tape this week. Which one... Which one influenced you more this week? Your outside circumstances or your fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Which one dictated your emotions this week? Did you focus on the spirit of truth, of what God thinks of you, or what other people thought, thought of you? Before we move on to the next process, I want to tell you something. We have a choice. When these lines start developing in our hearts at a young age because of something done to us, we have a choice, and we don't know of the choice. We can either medicate the hurt of our heart, or we can have healing. How many of you have ever taken morphine? It's okay, legally, having <laughs> Can I tell you, not enough of you. That stuff is good. Morphine is awesome when you're in pain. It is really good stuff. But it heals absolutely nothing. We call it medicine, but it doesn't heal anything. What does it do? It medicates our hurts, right? Now get this comparison. We medicate the hurts of our heart with sin. Sin is the morphine of the soul. You go, well, what's sin? Sin is anything in my life that is outside of the nature of God, nature and character of God. How many of you have sinned this week? Some of us will put up both hands. And so what happens, what gives, what gives, you ever come to the place where Paul did? Paul gets very frustrated at one point. Here's a guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and he goes, ooh, 
He might have even cussed. I'm not sure. Dave, I don't really mean that. He probably didn't. But he, he says, <laughs> yes, I don't know the Greek for that. But um, he says, the things that I wish I wouldn't do, I do. And the things that I wish I wouldn't, I do, I would do, I don't do them. And he's so, he's so frustrated. And then he goes, what wretched man I am. Hey, here's a guy who wrote two thirds of the New Testament who planted churches all over Minor Asia, who is just a fundamental authority in our faith relationship with church and God today and, and just incredible in our doctrine, giving us so doctrine. And he's going like, oh, sometimes I opt for morphine instead of the mercy and love of God that heals the hurts of my heart. You get that? You see, you and I will naturally choose sin because morphine is good when you're in pain instead of saying, I need the mercy of God. And some of you go, well, I would opt for the mercy of God. I just don't know how to get it. Mm -hmm. Write these three things down, please. Number one, it's not going to be strange. Some of you have heard it. Ownership. Ownership of your pain. Go to God and take ownership. Survey by Josh McDowell in 1989, 1989 said that 80% of high school seniors surveyed leaving high school, 80% of them that had, a, that had had a sexual encounter had their first one between the ages of 8 and 12. What do you think that does to the innocence of a soul? And if that was happening in 1989, what's happening now? You see, one of the reasons that we can take ownership of our hurts is I promise you that every single one of us have hurts of the heart and every single one of us, our hurt didn't begin with what we did to ourselves but it began with what somebody else did to us. And it doesn't have to be just sexual. It can be uh, an over-disciplinary, um, a very strong parent or neglectful one. It can be a coach. I had some winners of some coaches. Some of them were good, some of them weren't. It could be a teacher. It could be a, it could be a group of classmates that label you a loser. And all of a sudden, or you're not as good of an athlete. You sit on the bench. My first year of varsity, thought I was awesome because I got moved up to varsity as a sophomore. I was curious what position I was going to play. Apparently, tailback. When I asked the coach to play, he said, "Get your tailback." <laughs> oh, jeez! I go play JV and play all the time and sit on the bench the whole season. Those things are things, they're not necessarily wrong, but they hurt our hearts, don't they? To certain degrees. And so what do we do? We have pain, so we know what to do. Go get some morphine, some soul, some sin, because it makes the soul feel good. The majority of things done to us that hurt our hearts are done to us, not by us. So the first thing we need to do is we need to take ownership of them. The second thing is we need to be transparent with God. God, these are my hurts. As a matter of fact, most of you go, I got hurts, but I don't know what they are. Man, I've gotten over them. No, you haven't, by the way. You've just taken so much morphine, you don't even know what's wrong. You're in a spiritual soulish stupor. And so you turn to Psalm 139 and you read the last verses that say, Search me, O God, and know my heart. See what evil thing has hurt my heart. You search me and look. You show me so that I can be transparent with you and receive your love and your mercy. And then the third thing, receiving his love and mercy. So you take ownership, you become transparent, and you receive his love and mercy. As you do that, it starts taking away the barriers. And now all of a sudden your soul begins to get healthier. And now you're more responsive to the Holy Spirit. Now, 
there are four steps to responding or to living and walking with the Spirit. Do I have time? Not really. So I'm gonna introduce this, the same thing happened in the last service. I'm gonna introduce these four steps, read the passage from the first one, and then next week we're gonna, we're going to dive right in, which probably really does make a lot of sense. But in your celebration guide, you have a little diagram there. And there's actually four, four stations there. There's responding to the Holy Spirit, imitating Jesus or Christ, Finding and following God's will and living to love. Chances are you have decided that walking with the Holy Spirit and being in step with God means one of these four things. But chances are few of us have ever put all four of them together. And depending on how we're made up, whether we're strong will or strong intellectual, strong feeling, at some point, some of you, maybe you heard a sermon and go, that's right, i got to be more like Christ. And so you start reading the Bible, you thought walking with the Spirit and being a good Christian is imitating Jesus. So you get up on Monday morning, put yourself on some Galilean clothing, start wearing flip-flops, and walking around going to work. Blessings. <laughs> I'll pray for you. Or maybe finding and following God's will. You jump into the process and that's all you focus on. You take uh, Henry Blackaby's study on experiencing God and you indulge in that. That's all you do. By the way, if you take that study and that's all you do, then you really didn't get the study. Okay, it's a great study. Or maybe you decided, I get it. These people around here are getting a little stoked about missions. And so I'll go on a mission trip. Or I'll give some money to a mission trip, or I'll come and volunteer in somebody, and I'm going to learn. I am going to learn to love people whether I like them or not. Now I'm spiritual. I'm walking in the spirit. I must be a great Christian. Listen, please. Only when you and I enter this process with the empowerment and being illuminated to the power and the person of the Holy Spirit will we ever be able to pull off imitating Jesus. You try to pull off imitating Jesus without the power and illumination of the Holy Spirit, and people will start calling you a hypocrite. You will call yourself a hypocrite. You'll sit in the mirror and go, you're such a hypocrite. It's a depressing moment. But whenever you and I are illuminated to the Holy Spirit, then we become empowered to imitate Christ. One of the things we saw Jesus do throughout his ministry is every opportunity he got, he was trying to steal a moment to go away and do what? Pray. He would tell the Pharisees, look, why are you so upset? I'm only doing what I see the Father doing. Jesus was passionately pursuing, finding and following the will of the Father. But he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Was he not, according to Scripture, conceived by the Holy Spirit? This means yes, in North Carolina, this means yes, he was. Was the Holy Spirit present in his baptism? Yes, he was. Did the Holy Spirit lead him into the wilderness? Yes, he was. The Holy Spirit was essential to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And then as we are responding and illuminating to the Holy Spirit, we're imitating Christ and we're finding and following God's will, we discover the second greatest commandment that Jesus said, to love your neighbor as your Lord. We're going to talk about that in weeks to come. So let me close with just reading this passage in 2 Corinthians 3, 17. 2, well, we're going to start with verse 16, actually. 2 Corinthians, yeah, we're up there somewhere. Um, that's perfect. That is correct. I've got it written wrong in my notes. But when, I love it. Help me out that way. But when one turns to the Lord, one turns to the man upstairs. One turns to my homie. Uh -uh. One turns to the really good person that I believe in, but I don't submit to. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is... What veil? Well, let's read on and find out. Now, the Lord is the... Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is. Hmm. Do you 
want a, just a great gauge of whether or not you're in harmony with the Holy Spirit? How much freedom do you have in your heart? Freedom from what? Morphine? Freedom from sin? And Paul goes on and says, And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, being transformed. That word is huge. This word, transformed, right here, is exactly what Jesus is up to in your life. The Holy Spirit, the moment that you are awakened to the life of the Holy Spirit in you, He starts going to work and forming the image of Jesus the Son in and through you. Without the Holy Spirit, without that unveiling, you don't get it. You and I don't get it. We simply don't get it. We're being transformed into the same image of the one decree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is, the final word, spirit. So this is what I want this morning. I want you to completely comprehend the best you can, and maybe in small groups discuss again the whole makeup of the soul and the, the effect that sin has in living from the inside out. But what we need to move on and see is we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He is alive and well. And Jesus did what he did so that the Holy Spirit could come and empower us to live the way that he wanted, but we must submit to him as Lord because we don't get it until we turn to him and say, you're the Lord of my life, you can have everything. <coughs> you get it all. If you would please stand here. worship for just a moment. I just want to encourage you, just with this, what's been said this morning, pick a point and say, God, help me with that. Help me with that. Teach me what you want to teach me. Show me, show me the things that have interrupted your life in me. I want my soul to reflect your image. I want to be in fellowship with you. I want to be attracted to you for me inside out. I'm tired of trying to do it from the outside in. God, we ask that you would illuminate our hearts and our minds to truth this morning, that you would speak healing, that the hurts would be the healer this morning in worship. And that you would unveil the presence of your Holy Spirit that's living inside of us. And the Holy Spirit would begin the work of forming the image of Jesus Christ in and through us. Lord, as we prepare our hearts for communion and we take this communion, may we sense your very Holy Spirit leading us to the table and saying, I want to do this in remembrance of what you've done for me. I don't want to come to this table unworthily. I don't want to come to this table with not acknowledging you as my Lord. You are my king. Lord, I ask that during this communion and worship time, 